London, the tribute to the United Nations took the form of a salute to the flags, with the representatives of the Allies in Britain attending an impressive ceremony in the Mall. General Sir Bernard Paget, Commander-in-Chief Home Forces, and General Sir Arthur Smith, commanding the London District, took the salute at the base of the Duke of York's steps as the big parade marched by. White uniformed nurses and civil defence workers headed the long column. Similar ceremonies were held elsewhere in Britain and overseas on this day when the Allied flags are publicly honoured. Hundreds of war workers took part in the procession, boiler suits and dungarees, the uniforms of land army girls and bus conductresses, the working clothes of the army of home fronters. All these added their rightful share to a truly representative parade. Then came contingents of the Royal and Merchant Navies. Twenty-seven flags and twenty-seven good reasons for this celebration on the anniversary of United Nations Day. During a whole day's visiting of ATS units serving in the Greater London area, Queen Elizabeth and the Princess Royal saw some of the extensive work being done at an Ordnance Depot. Second from the right is the Prime Minister's daughter, Mary Churchill. Her Majesty was then at an anti-aircraft battery where girls work the predictors which serve the gunners. Britain's anti-aircraft defence system is largely operated by girls. This visit to the gun pits was another illustration of the Queen's deep interest in the Auxiliary Territorial Service. When the gallant commander of the 8th Army was in London a few weeks ago to report to the War Office, and incidentally to snatch a few days' well-earned leave, the news spread like a prairie fire. The general was all but mobbed everywhere he went. The man who snatched victory from near defeat has touched the public imagination as few soldiers ever do. While he was in London, he went to several theatres, and in every case, he was public attraction number one. He's 
back with the 8th Army on the job again. And the Axis in Sicily, like their defeated comrades in Libya and North Africa, are feeling the veteran fighting quality of Monty and his men. The Allied grip on Sicily tightens. These pictures were taken during the early days of the invasion. The first chapter had ended with the arrival of the great invasion armada of 2,000 ships, which safely delivered their cargoes of fighting men onto the beaches of the Axis stronghold. Canadians and French, British and Americans, many of them veterans of the desert and North African campaigns, now found themselves and their equipment on another continent, that of Hitler's Europe. The first installment of the Axis account was long overdue, and these grim-faced men were here to collect. Already the first prisoners were coming into the net, soon to swell to tens of thousands. Italians these mostly, dupes of the fascist bullies whose hour was already striking. And so the first great Allied invasion force moved forward. The countryside echoed now to the unceasing roar of good British and American motors as armoured and supply vehicles in their hundreds rolled into action. Nineteen fifteen to eighteen. Then the Italians were on the right side. These prisoners are the sons of those other Italians who fought at the side of the Allies twenty-five years ago. For them, the war is over. For Italy, it is rapidly drawing to its end. <laughs> 